Hi everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Jose Cascana, I'll tell you a bit more about myself in a little bit. Welcome everybody to World War II in the Pacific start to finish. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about World War II in the Pacific, but also about uh, other parts of uh, World War II. Uh, to get started, I invite everybody to uh, uh, move your hats, uh, stand up for uh, the presentation of the colors by American Legion Post 26. The national anthem is going to be sung by Christine Cherry. Uh, feel free to put your hand over a heart or uh, salute, and we have many veterans uh, as you feel fit. Well, thank you very much, uh, Post 26, for uh, doing that. Still doesn't uh, go a day by the national anthem, but it, to a certain extent, almost brings a, a tear to my eye. So the question is, why are we here today? I think everyone showed up for the uh, free beer at the end, right? No? If you could just see it from this perspective, I, there was a lot of uh, surprised faces, but I think pleasantly surprised that there's free beer at the end. Well then, you guys are here for the right reason then. By the way, if uh, you buy a mug, you get free beer, so there's still some for sale. So my name is Jose Castaneda. I retired from the Air Force about a year ago. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I was a uh, pilot uh, flying B-52s for uh, most of my career. So I'm going to tell you how this event comes near and dear to my heart. The uh, 379th Bomb Group, which is what I attempt to address as today, was activated on November 26, 1942 in Gallenfield, Boise, Idaho. It consisted of squadrons of, B uh, of uh, B-17s, uh, and they uh, began movement in April and May to arrive at Kimbleton, England, Army Air Forces Station 117. And its first combat mission was in the bombing of German U-boat uh, pens in St. Nazaire, France on May 29, 1943. They uh, belonged uh, to 8th Air Force, so for many of you guys, this is probably not a surprise. Uh, so as you can tell, I'm wearing my uh, 
8th Air Force Mighty 8th uh, commemorative shirt uh, today. And then if uh, wondering why the triangle K, the uh, triangle uh, K insignia uh, was uh, K's the 11th letter of the alphabet. So the div division was represented by a triangle. Different divisions of the Air Force were represented by different shapes. And since it was the 11th unit to enter the war, it was indicated by letter K. This is an attempt at a representation to include the hat, which they let me borrow from the museum, of possibly how a pilot from uh, World War II uh, may have dressed. They do have some more uh, other original things, but uh, let's just say they were built to be in a cockpit at like 20,000 feet at like minus 10 degrees. And so I, uh, Opted not to. Uh, so as I said earlier, I was privileged to be part of 8th Air Force for over half my time uh, in the Air Force and actually was able to be part of the modern day 379th Air Expeditionary Wing, which was a 379th group uh, back in World War II uh, when I was stationed at the Air Base outside Doha in Qatar. And so as you can tell, you know, there's so much lineage that goes on and so it's, uh, it's very, very near and dear to my heart. And if you think about it during World War II, what was going on in World War II and why are we celebrating today? By today, in 1945, the number of deaths in World War II, although remains uncertain, had reached about 70 million. Think about that, 70 million people had died, the carnage. 22 million military and the remaining 48 million were other civilian deaths due to military operations or uh, crimes against humanity. Casualties in the Pacific were about half of that, 36 million. So four years of war and 36 uh, million uh, people had died in the Pacific at this point. So today is August 14th, there you go. Now, although it's not quite 1900 hours, I'm going to play for you what everybody heard on the radio at 1900 hours, August 14th, uh, 1945. This afternoon, a message from the Japanese government, in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th, I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Arrangements are now being made for the formal signing of the surrender terms at the earliest possible moment. General Douglas MacArthur has been appointed the Supreme Allied Commander to receive the Japanese surrender. Great Britain, Russia, and China will be represented by high-ranking officers. Meantime, the Allied Armed Forces have been ordered to suspend offensive action. The proclamation of VJ Day must await upon the formal signing of the surrender terms by Japan. So there we go, VJ Day. That's what we are celebrating today. Obviously, uh, the um, declaration was signed uh, uh, a few days later. But while it was August 14th in the United States, it was August 15th already in, uh, on the other side of the Pacific. So at noon in Japan, they played their Japanese national anthem, followed by the uh, emperor's speech. Now, to think about it, Noon in Japan was 9 p.m. here. So just two hours later, after President Truman uh, gave his declaration on the radio, so did uh, we got we got to listen to YouTube ads. You know how that goes. Uh, so did the Japanese um, emperor. Thank you. 
So put yourselves in the shoes of the whole world that they just listen to President Truman say the war is over. And two hours later, everyone starts to listen to this over the radio and it was broadcast worldwide. Well, it was being broadcast in Japanese, obviously in Japan, there was uh, somebody translating it uh, to English. And it goes as follows. To our good and loyal subjects, after pondering deeply the general trends of the world and the actual condition obtaining in our empire today, we have decided to effect a settlement of the present situation by resorting to an extraordinary measure. <clears throat> now let me pause there and tell you this is going to sound very, uh, you know, people equate it to listening to Shakespeare. The emperor spoke in such a classical Japanese that many Japanese people actually didn't understand it and they had to get it explained to them later. So if it sounds that way, it's not a bad, it's not because it's a bad translation. This is what you would have heard. We have ordered our government to communicate to the government of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union that our empire accepts the provisions of their joint declaration. To strive for the common prosperity and happiness of all nations as well as security and well-being of our subjects is a solemn obligation which has been handed down by our imperial ancestors and which lies close to our heart. Indeed, we declared war in America and Britain out of our sincere desire to ensure Japan's self-preservation and the stabilization of East Asia, it being far from our thought to either infringe upon the sovereignty of the nations or to embark upon territorial or aggrandizement. But now, the war has lasted nearly four years. Despite the best that has been done by everyone, the gallant fighting of the military and naval forces, the diligence and the assiduity of our servants of the state, and the devoted service of 100 million people, the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage, while the general trends of the world have all turned against her interests. Moreover, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable, taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and the obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. Such being the case, how are we to save the millions of our subjects, or to atone ourselves before the hallowed spirits of our imperial ancestors? This is the reason why we have ordered the acceptance of the provisions of the Joint Declaration of Powers, also known as the Potsdam Declaration. We cannot but express the deepest sense of regret to our allied nations of East Asia who have consistently cooperated with the Empire towards emancipation of East Asia. The thoughts of those officers and men, as well as those who have fallen in the fields of battle, those who died at the posts of duty, and those who met with untimely death, and all the bereaved, ber bereaved Families pains our heart night and day. The welfare of the wounded and the war suffers, and of those who have lost their homes and livelihood are the object of our profound solicitude. The hardships and sufferings to which our nation is to be subjected hereafter will be certainly great. We are keenly aware of the inmost feelings of all of you, our subjects. However, it is according to the dictates of time and fate that we have resolved to pave way for the grand peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and suffering what is insufferable. Having been able to safeguard and maintain our sovereignty, we're always with you, our good and loyal subjects, relying upon your sincerity and integrity. Beware most strictly of any outbursts of emotion which may engender needle, needless complications or any fraternal contention and strife which may create confusion, lead you astray, and cause you to lose the confidence of the world. Let the entire nation continue as one family from generation to generation, ever firm in its faith in the imperishability of the sacred land, and mindful of its heavy burden and the long road before it. Unite your total strength to be devoted to the construction for the future. Cultivate the ways of rectitude, foster nobility of spirit, and work with resolution, so that you may enhance the innate glory of the imperial state and keep peace excuse me, and keep pace with the progress of the world. So it's pretty amazing that these two addresses were essentially addressed worldwide. Um, interesting historical fact, even though President Truman's was live, uh, the Emperor's was not. Uh, he pre-recorded, they recorded it twice. The first time it sounded too uh, low, and then the second time it sounded uh, not quite right either, but they went ahead and kept it. 
But at that point, uh, there was a, 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 a kind of mini invasion would occur at, at where he was uh, hiding out, and they took the two uh, recordings he had made and and then uh, played them later on. But they picked a time to play them very interestingly after the um, after this occurred. Uh, so uh, quite quite interesting uh, what went on. So if you can put yourselves in that situation. Uh, essentially, uh, 1945, this huge war where almost 70 million people died, if not more, finally came to an end on both sides, at least the portion of the Pacific, uh, by both the President's declaration and Japan's admission. So I think today it makes it a, a very uh, good day and it uh, just works out that August 14th is uh, also Saturday so we can all be here. So obviously all this could have happened without the uh, great, uh, I guess, work efforts and, and the sacrifice of, of many, many veterans, of which we have many here for many wars. So right now I'd like to take the opportunity to ask anybody who uh, is a veteran or active duty member of the uh, United States Armed Forces uh, to please stand up and be recognized. each and every single one of you, because without people like you, this uh, country would not be as uh, great as it is today. Now with that said, uh, I'd like to move on to uh, our, uh, if you will, our um, main event. We have many other things going on, but uh, we were very, very lucky to have uh, Colonel uh, Joaquin McPhail, United States Marine Corps, retire uh, here with us today. Joe was born in October 10, 1921, in Grand Salem, Texas. Yes, 1921. I'm seeing every one of y'all doing the math. Definitely. Uh, 1921 is correct. Uh, he earned his private pilot license in the summer of 1941, and uh, he's been flying uh, ever since. He has over 17,000 flying hours, 13,000 civilian, and 4,000 military. Uh, he joined the Marines uh, October 18, 1941, went on active duty three days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, he went to fighter pilot training, earning his wings October 2, 1942. And he flew Wildcat Flying Patrol in the Central Pacific Theater afterwards. So uh, he's going to give us uh, good stories about actually flying the war in the Pacific. Colonel McPhail was assigned to the most successful Marine Fighting Squadron of 1945, VMF 323, the Death Rattlers. In just a few weeks, they shot down 124 and a half Japanese planes and counted a dozen aces. April 12, 1945, while on patrol in the Corsair, Joe McPhail himself shot down a Japanese Zero. And uh, basically a month later, May 4, 1945, he shot down an eight. And then uh, we have a question and answer session, although uh, he's only shot down two airplanes, ask him why he uh, does consider himself an ace. And I say only shot down two airplanes in World War II, like, you know, only, right? But, no, that's, that's great. Uh, and then after the outbreak of the Korean conflict, uh, the Black Sheep Squadron, he was given short notice to get ready, and by August of 1950, the Black Sheep were above the USS Sicily Strait and moved to the Korean waters and into the fight. And another, uh, Chapter of the illustration of the history of the Black Ship Squadron was being written as the Fighting 214th was the first Marine squadron to see action in Korea. Colonel McPhail is credited with 240 combat missions and, as we talked about earlier, two air to air victories. Um, skipped a few things here because I don't want to take away uh, from his thunder, but he's just some amazing stories. So now we'll just sit down and have a chat and see what he's got to tell us. And please, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand and uh, uh, we'll, we'll call on you. and. Uh, just, uh, we'll chat because this is just some amazing stories. So without further ado, uh, Colonel uh, Joe McPhail.
say I'm honored to be here. Uh, I've all my, all my life, I haven't done anything else. And uh, I feel blessed uh, for doing the thing that I, I like to do to him. At the summer of 1941, uh, I graduated from high school in 39. That summer, I, I enrolled in CPT, Civilian Pilot Training, and uh, I flew about 40 hours that summer and really got hooked on flying. And I wanted to continue, and I checked with all the military bases, and they, they said you had to be 20 years old and have 50 or 60 hours of college. And I'd gone to junior college and I had my 60 hours, but I wasn't 20 in. But eight days after I was 20 on uh, October the 18th, 1941, uh, I enrolled at the uh, Naval Air Station in Dallas and uh, started flight training. And, uh, all the way through, it, it took about 10 months, of, and I uh, graduated, got my wings on October the 2nd, 1942, and uh, it took about 10 months to go through flight school. I graduated in October of 1942, and uh, went to San Diego, California and waited and went overseas in January of 42 and uh, joined the fighter squadron in Samoa and flying wildcats and uh, it, it was uh, not too good of an airplane. It, it didn't have a hydraulic system and so you crank the gear up with a crank and you crank the gear down and you fire the shotgun shell to start the engine uh, and uh, a lot of other things. You charge the guns with a cable and a cockpit and uh, but uh, it, it, it was the best we had at that time. And so I, I flew it for about 200 hours. And, and, uh, but we, we were in the Central Pacific. And uh, we were occupying islands to keep the Japanese from occupying them. And uh, I, I was ordered to go home in, in 1953 and uh, joined the rather training squadron in, in Southern California and I stayed there until I was called back to active duty again in January of 1945 and joined the squadron on the Central Pacific of the MF-323. We call them the Death Rattlers. And um, I did most of my flying at, at Okinawa. And uh, after
and uh, was uh, in the reserve uh, fighter squadron there in uh, Naval Air Station Dallas. And, but that, that squadron was called out for Korea in 1950. And so I ended up in uh, Korea in October 1950 and uh, joined the fighter squadron 214. It was uh, black black sheep squadron and, and most of these old guys remember the TV program uh, Bob Bob Black Sheep. And, uh, so. That was the squadron I was in, but uh, Boeington was the commanding officer when they were in the South Pacific in 1943. Uh, but he, he, he had been gone a long time uh, when, when I joined the squadron. We uh, got Corsairs then, and I, I, it had a lot more power than the Wildcat. And I, I'd like to tell people uh, I'm a generic ace. Ace is five airplanes. And I wrecked three American airplanes and shot down two Japanese planes. <laughs> so I consider myself a generic ace. Yeah. That's, that's about the extent of my military training. I flew for a, a gas transmission company out of Houston Hobby for 33 years and have a total of about 17,000 hours. I had two distinguished flying crosses, 11 air medals, and uh, recommendation for uh, another medal and uh, okay so uh, that's, that's about it yeah.
anybody have any questions you'd like to ask the Colonel today? Don't be shy. Hold your hand to him. Here's the lady back here. How did you wreck the three airplanes? Oh yeah, well, I grabbed a little bit. I also ran out of fuel and, and had to land the Wildcat in the Central Pacific and uh, ground loop another, another one. Uh, so that was a three. Uh, uh, tell them about your time in the water in the Pacific. How long yeah, were you out there and how yeah, did you get rescued? Well, I uh, landed in, uh, they had an automatic uh, uh, life raft. It was water activated, and it wasn't, you know, later on we started sitting on a, a parachute or uh, 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 life raft, and uh, then, then it was before they had seat life rafts, and uh, water activated it, it inflated, and the, they had a, a lanyard on it to keep it from going away, and it, but it, it broke and turned the raft upside down and lost all my fish hooks and uh, other things. And, uh, but uh, I, I used a diet, diet marker uh, to uh, people started, you know, I was about 20 miles from the base and they, they started flying in there. I'd see them, but they didn't, didn't see me. But finally, uh, the dive marker uh, showed them where I was located. They called, called the base, and the base set a PT boat out to pick me up. And, uh, it was all pretty, pretty rough sea, about 10 to 10 feet. And, uh, I thought I was going to drown in the PT boat, but they finally got me to the base. How long Probably three hours. I was only about 20 miles from the island. And the reason I ran out of fuel uh, to get a tow plane or the sleeve in the air, um, the wildcat. To, didn't have enough power and everything, so they, they didn't put enough fuel they purposely left a uh, reserve. And so when, when they finally were picked up by radar, uh, it was 80, 80 miles that we'd already passed the island. And so uh, uh, I, I was hoping that uh, they could find, find me in, in, in a PT boat, but they, they finally were able to uh, pick me up and I thought, sure, I was going to drown in, in a PT boat. Uh, it would be pretty heavy, heavy sea. Okay, how about uh, another question here? Anybody else over here? It's Colonel, right? Colonel, um, it's an honor to be in the audience, um, have your presentation, be part of your presentation today. So we just really thank you for your service. And um, with your history through the wars and through times of difficulty and times of you know things we're blessed with today, uh, some people would say that we're kind of in an ideological, ideological cold war today in the U.S. What's your advice to us as people that? Are beneficiaries of your sacrifices and many others um, with what we're facing with our generation today. Well, you know, we, we need to honor the people that, that served uh, in, in World War II and, and Korea. Uh, it, it's uh, so important uh, that we have people that, that want to show their appreciation and we, uh, I, I, thank God and uh, I was able to get through both World War II and, and Korea and hope for other people to feel the same way.
How about another question over here on this side? Don't be shy. Well, Kurt, I'd like to thank you for your service, like everyone else. But my question to you is, you've seen everywhere from the beginning of the aviation to what we have now. What are your views on it, how it's improved, going from five planes to jet engines? drag banners for practice. Do you have any recollections of early flight training or maybe an instructor that stuck sticks in your mind that you remember? Talk to him about the kind of military planes that you flew. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I had to fly an SPD, a Doug, a Douglas built dive bomber. I was due to come home, and, and we, the squadron was getting Corsairs, and uh, they didn't want me to take their time, and so they put me in this SPD to. To uh, patrol out, out of Samoa, and uh, it, it had about two months of, of, of flying, and then I came on. But I tore those pages out of my logbook. I, I was afraid they were going to make a dive bomber proud of it. I think we got time for yeah. one more question. Where was it? Over here? Here, here you go. How many days were you in a warfare? How many days did you spend in the war? Oh, uh, let's see. I spent uh, about 13 months the first time I went overseas in World War II. And, uh, uh, and uh, I got called back for Korea, and I flew only about 10 months, but I flew 100, 100 missions uh, in 10 months, and uh, the, then the war ended uh, in July of 1950. Okay, I think that'll do it. So, uh, the Colonel will be 100 years young, in two more months, so let's give him a big hand.
Thank you for that applause, Mark. We've got a booth set up over here, so after the program or throughout the day, if you'd like to stop by and personally visit with him, shake his hand, and get an autographed photo. Thank you all. And the audience, uh, we're also pleased to have uh, pleased to have uh, Richard Gunter. Uh, he's uh, right from Towner, North Dakota. Uh, was in the 82nd Airborne. Uh, do you have any any stories you'd like to uh, talk about? No? No stories? Well, story time can't be over yet. No. Well, thank uh, Mr. Gunther very much and everyone else who uh, has served uh, for all the service. It's just, it's, it's wonderful to, uh, to be here. So now as we continue with our program, uh, to continue to uh, honor all those who served on uh, celebration of uh, VJ Day. I guess it be the 76th anniversary. We missed it last year, but uh, doing it this year. I'd like to continue uh, the program with the singing of all the military uh, anthems uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, Richard Rao, who will be uh, singing for us. So as uh, we do the singing and each uh, flag uh, does uh, uh, come by, uh, like to sing along if when we get your service, the medley of anthems, go ahead. So without any further ado, Mr. Richard Brown. Over hills, over dale, we have hit the dusty trail, and the caissons go rolling along. In and out, hear them shout, town in march and right about, and the caissons go rolling along. Then it's high, high, in the field of jewelry, shout out your lumbers loud and strong, for wherever we go, you always know that the caissons are rolling along. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles in the air on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of the United States Marines. Anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to college choice, we sail at break of day. Once more, here's wishing you a happy voyage home. Off we go into the wild blue, yonder climbing high into the sun. Here they come, soon to be our thunder, out of our sight to the sun. Down the dice, spouting a flame from under, off with one terrible course. We'll live in flame, or go down in flame. Hey, nothing can stop the U.S. Air Force. We're always ready for the call. We place our trust in thee. To serve and soar and all engage, I shall our purpose be. Semper Paratus is our guide. Our fame and glory too. The coast our fights through 
storms and winds, hey, takes Lord, to be our you. Mr. Rauer for that wonderful rendition of our anthems. If you guys, uh, does anyone here know uh, about the Battlefield Cross? I would think you would. Anybody? Hands? Yes? A few? So, uh, Battlefield Cross is essentially a fallen soldier cross or Battlefield Cross. Uh, times when you just unfortunately have to, you know, bury people right then and there, or a mark where they might die, and didn't necessarily have a cross. Could build a battlefield cross, a uh, fallen soldier cross, uh, right then and there. So to uh, help uh, explain and uh, as it gets built, uh, this tradition that in many cases say dates back to the Civil War. Uh, here's Mr. Uh, Paul Simonson uh, reading, and the cross will be built by uh, members of the Civil American Veterans Chapter Four. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. The Soldier or Battlefield Cross Ceremony is remember, honor, and impart the value and price of freedom. That is the mission for every citizen of the United States of America to embrace who lives under the flag of liberty. During our brief history as a nation, hundreds of thousands of our finest have laid down their lives for the cause of freedom. Approximately 83,000 over the last century alone were captured, suffering unspeakable torment while others became missing and have yet to be found. Meanwhile, countless others have sustained injuries, some of which healed. Other wounds were left life-altering, leaving the veteran to cope daily with a high level of anguish, often impossible to speak of. Today we honor, we remember, and we thank all of these ones who suffered on our behalf for the cause of liberty, and most especially those who have paid the ultimate price for our freedom, having given all. The Soldier Cross, or Field Cross, has its origins dating back to the Civil War in that when soldiers were hastily buried between battles, the, soldier, <clears throat> the rifle was stabbed in the ground to mark their final resting place. Anything that identified the fallen was placed on the rifle so others would know who eternally rested there. Today, service members on the battlefield cannot attend the funeral of their fallen brothers and sisters in arms, so the battlefield or Soldier's Cross is placed in honor for those who have perished as a way to pay their last respects. Let us now review the meaning of the items which comprise the Soldier's Cross. Over to our right here underneath the wing. The rifle and bayonet, the rifle with the affixed bayonet is the most important tool of United States fighting man and woman. It is the core to the livelihood and the key to their survival. It is thrust into the ground, signifying that the one being remembered died in battle, fighting to the end. It also signifies that the battle is over for this person when the rifle is left this way. The boots. The boots carry a service member through the fight of our freedom. They are the first and the most important means of transportation. The boots are placed at the base of the rifle. They are worn and dirty, reminding us that the final march to the last battle. The dog tags. Dog tags are worn by each service member. They, they imprinted into them all of their important identifying information regarding the individual. The dog tags are hung from the rifle so that the name of the fallen will never be forgotten. The helmet. 
The helmet is an important piece of protection on the battlefield. Some believe that the hat or helmet of the individual represents what a person stood for, and so the helmet is placed on top of the rifle, signifying that the battle is over and the great sacrifice has been made. It will never be worn again. The Bible. The Bible is open to John 15, verse 13, with the words, Greater love has no man than to lay his life down for another. The Bible is placed close to the boots that states that this person's walk is over. They laid their life down for their country, a country that was founded with the words, In God we trust. Now ordinarily we would be playing taps, but because of another uh, flag holding ceremony, taps will be played after that, but normally taps would be played during this part of the program. But thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Simonson, that was wonderful. Now, uh, next, uh, we're going to do a rendition of the uh, Vietnam uh, deck of cards. You guys have not, not heard the story. It was originally written by Tex Ritter in 1948. Uh, it's been adapted uh, for different conflicts, different wars. And the specific one's going to be uh, Vietnam deck of cards. And the, sun, the, so the song is going to be sung by uh, Richard Grauer. Well, It was during the Vietnam camp conflict campaign, a bunch of soldier boys had been on a long hike and they arrived in a town called Saigon. The next morning during Sunday, several of the boys went to church. A sergeant commanded the boys in church and after the chaplain had read the prayer, the text was taken up. Those of the boys who had a fervor took them out, but this one boy had only a deck of cards who had spread them out. The sergeant saw the cards and said, Soldier, put away those cards. After the service was over, the soldier was taken prisoner and brought before the provost marshal. The marshal said, Sergeant, why have you brought this man? For playing cards in church, sir. And what have you to say to yourself, young man? Must, sir, replied the soldier. The marshal said, I hope so. So for, for I shall not punish you more than you, any man was ever punished. The soldier said, Sir, I've been on the march for about six days. I have neither a Bible nor a prayer book, but I hope to satisfy you, sir, with the purity of my intention. And with that, the boy started his story. You see, sir, when I look at the ace, it reminds me that there is one God, and the douche reminds me that the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old and the New Testament. When I see the tray, I think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when I see the four, I think of the four evangelists who preached the gospel. They were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when I see the five, it reminds me of the five wise virgins who trimmed their lamps. There were ten of them. Five were wise and were saved. Five were foolish and were shut out. And when I see the six, it reminds me that in six days, God made this great heaven and earth. And when I see the seven, it reminds me that on the seventh day, God rested from his great work. And when I see the eight, it reminds me the eight righteous persons God saved when he destroyed this earth. There was Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. And when I see the nine, I think of the lepers that are saving claims, and nine of the ten didn't even thank him. And when I see the ten, I think of the Ten Commandments God handed down to Moses on the tablet of stone. 
And when I see the king, it reminds me that there is only but one king of heaven, God Almighty. And when I see the queen, I think of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is queen of heaven. And Jack or Nay is the devil. And when I count the number of spots on the cards, I find 365. The number of days in a year. There are 52 cards, the number of weeks in a year. There are four suits, the number of weeks in a month. There are 12 picture cards, the number of months in a year. There are 13 tricks, the number of weeks in a quarter. So you see, sir, my deck of cards serve me as a Bible, an almana, and a prayer book. And friends, the story is true. I know that soldier was my son. Mr. Rauer, and thank you very much uh, to Dakota for uh, portraying uh, the deck of cards. My following, we're going to have a flight for this morning. Uh, many of you have probably been a witness to one. If you haven't, it's your first time in for a treat. Uh, it's just uh, simply amazing. As uh, I said earlier, uh, Taps is going to be played uh, at the end, and uh, anybody who would like to uh, feel free to stand to uh, commemorate every fallen soldier, POW, MIA, who has been lost in so many wars that uh, allow us human freedom to be able to be here today and congregate and uh, worship as, as we like. So without any further ado, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Uh, Adam Thorpe and Rick Montoya from the FW Post uh, 453 going to fold the flag. And the reading can be done by Mr. Dean uh, Restrade from Post 26 of the American Legion. flag-folding ceremony represents the same religious principles on which our great country was originally founded. The portion of the flag donating in honor is the Canton field of blue dresses from left to right and is inverted only when draped as a pole on a casket of a veteran who has served our country honorably in uniform. In the armed forces of the United States, at the ceremony of retreat, the flag is lowered, folded in a triangle, in a triangle fold, and kept under watch throughout the night as a tribute to our relations that honored the dead. The next morning, it is brought out and at the ceremony of revelry, run aloft as a symbol of our belief in the resurrection of the body. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in the eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veterans departing our ranks and who gave a portion of life for the defense of our country to attain peace 
throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature, nature as for American citizens trusting God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well as in times of war for the, his divine guidance. The fifth fold, a tribute to our country, for in the words of Stephen Decor, our country, in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but it is our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is for where our hearts lie. It is with our hearts that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country, our flag against all enemies, whether they be found within or without boundaries of our republic. The Eightfold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day, and to honor our mother, for whom it lies, for whom it flies our mother's day. The Ninthfold is a tribute to womanhood, for it has been through their faith, loyal, love, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this great country great that have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to fathers, for he too has given the sons and daughters for the defense of our country since he or she was born. The eleventh fold is in the eyes of the Hebrew citizens represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon and glorifies in their eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold is in the eyes of the Christian citizen, represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes the Father, the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The thirteenth fold, or when the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national model. In God, we trust. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served from George Washington and the sailors and marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates in the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights, privileges, and freedom we enjoy today. If you can stand, please place your hand over your heart or the military may salute for the plane of pass.
We're going to have, uh, so now what, if, if everyone's uh, been uh, waiting for this, who uh, bought tickets for the drum? Oh, there we go. So, uh, what, what are you guys hoping to win? The airplane? All right. Well, we have Mr. Uh, Dwayne uh, Hugston, who uh, put it all together, is going to talk a little bit about uh, the drawing uh, while uh, we get uh, Mr. or excuse me, Colonel uh, McPhail to head over there. And he's going to, you know, he's, if he draws your name, then you're extra lucky today. You can say not only did you win the, the airplane, but uh, it was drawn by uh, Mr. Joe McPhail. So, uh, without further ado, here, please let us know a little bit about drawing how it worked out. Thank you everybody for coming. This is always, a, well for the last 25 years, this has been something that's been pretty near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, as most of you probably know, this is a major fundraiser for us for the year. And uh, this is our 25th, 25th airplane that we'll be giving away. Or as an option, uh, somebody who's not excited about aviation that much, uh, we have a $20,000 option on that. So they can either get the J3 Cub or $20,000 cash. And either way, the guy should walk away with a smile. So, without further ado, we'll get our drawing underway. One ticket. Colonel Joe McHale, we're very honored to have you pulling the winning ticket today. Is everybody holding their breath? Wow. This is a good one. Well, they're all good. But it's, it'll be a little bit more dear to many of us here in Minot, as the winner is Ralph B. Serdahl from Minot, North Dakota. So congratulations. I believe it's been quite a while since we've had anybody kind of local to win this, so uh, we're very excited about, about it for uh, Mr. Serdahl. We're thankful for all of you people who have been contributing to the museum and helping us in so many ways, but this is one of the good ones that gives back a little bit to you guys too. So. Thank you so very much. We appreciate y'all coming. And, uh, we will have another sweepstakes next year. So you can be the lucky winner for the 26th. Thank you. So, uh, I guess I'm the only uh, thing standing between uh, you and, uh, and some uh, free beer, so. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm just kidding. Where is he? Warren, do you know if the helicopter left? I'm here. It hasn't left, has it? He's saying no? I don't see him. Still there. Okay, so they're going to leave here at some point. So uh, once we're done, um, obviously you won't be too close to it. But as we head out, uh, you'll, you'll be able, you'll, you'll hear it starting up. And uh, you can uh, watch the helicopter leave, and that'll be uh, pretty cool. That being said, uh, I, I I thought this was wonderful. I hope you guys enjoyed it very much too. But you know, these kind of things can't get put on without the help of uh, veterans organizations. You know, they served and continue service today. Uh, the Save American Veterans uh, Chapter Four. Um, we've got the uh, VFW Post uh, 753. And uh, I'm missing one here, or post 26 of the American Legion. Uh, additionally, uh, 
you guys know Robin and Warren, uh, they're so very lucky, wonderful people without them to uh, this kind of stuff to occur. So let's give them all a big round of applause. Uh, Also, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming, and uh, feel free to you know, talk to anybody and you know, veterans any questions you have. Uh, enjoy uh, the museum and uh, uh, enjoy the beer. It's probably not too late to buy a mug if uh, it's getting warm enough. You might all need a mug, so please buy a mug. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a great day.